is a novelist. He's written for Broadway, television, a dramatist, screenwriter. Uh, was a congressional candidate, been an actor, political debater. Grover Dahl's <laughs> reputation among scholars is of an agent provocateur. He's a lively, witty mind, but very much enslaved by certain prejudices. His honesty is just unbelievable. He just doesn't... He's unable to not tell the truth. But I was born a writer, and you can't do both. A writer must always tell the truth <clears throat> as he sees it. <laughs> And a politician must never give the game away. These are two conflicting drives. I will take this occasion once again to speak louder. <laughs> it's always been an honor to, uh, to claim relation with one of the great authors of the 20th century. So. Well, that's very well said, Miss Gore. I, I think that's a very profound I sentiment. I believe it. It's very true. I suspect you told me it was a joke, but, but it was, isn't there a little bit of seriousness under that? A, a sort of insecurity, a, a no. defensiveness? Oh, yes. I'm so insecure, you know. I'm jittery with insecurity. Uh, that number doesn't work. So in the long run, we go back to my notion that the only art form the United States has ever created is the TV commercial. That is our art form, and that's how we control people. And it's a world of illusions, and it's a world of false claims. And if I'd been in that press conference, Nixon said, now we can't move out of there because we would, uh, of our role as the keeper of the peace in Asia. Well, now, who asked us to be the keeper of the peace in Asia? The That's two the largest right countries are India and China. To my knowledge, that we've not got a request from either one to be the keeper of the peace in Asia. We can't even do it in Manhattan. Well, most empires must begin somewhere, so... There's the Roman Empire, which began on the Tiber River, about 800 B.C right here in this extremely noisy city. Seven hills, a river, and then gradual expansion throughout the known world. And that would be the equivalent of the 13 original British colonies with which the United States began. Now here you see the Roman Empire absolutely at its peak under the Emperor Trajan. It includes all of the known world, and the Romans were the dominant power on Earth. Equivalent to that would be for the United States the period from about 1945 to the present day when you find our bases in Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, we are everywhere. So our empire is now global, theirs was local, but ours is breaking up and theirs did last 500 years. God is blackmailer. Uh, God is uh, warden of the prison. We created us all in his image, probably a mistake, and uh, then allows us to run wild and punishes us or rewards us with his beaming vision of himself. This is no God I really want to have any traffic with at all. After they set up the United States, they set it up really, that pursuit of happiness was rather a dangerous phrase, though it also has its good side. But we became really the greediest society on earth, you know, killing the Indians, grabbing lands, picking wars with other countries, conquering, conquering, conquering. And the society really was based on me, me, me. So all the bright people went into business. And they left then, I mean, why become a senator when you can buy one? Well, it was the first novel that had been published in England or America, or anywhere as far as I know, that dealt very openly uh, with homosexuality as being a perfectly normal sexual activity. Until then, all the books that had, been, that had touched upon this uh, were exotic. If you had a homosexual uh, protagonist, well, you almost never had a protagonist. There'd be a minor character. And it would always be a ballet dancer or a hairdresser or something like that. And it would be somebody quite effeminate. And I was dealing with two all-American boys, two young athletes, one of whom falls in love with the other. And th this was very, very shocking. Jefferson, yeah. and rather the bright side of Hamilton. Uh, it is quite true that they, were, they had bad sides to them. But gosh, they were bright. I mean, when you compare those people to uh, 
Nixon or uh, or Kennedy or Humphrey or any of these people who actually have no idea what they're doing except running for office. You see, the original Lincoln is so much more interesting than what the Carl Sandburgs and the national hagiographers, lovely word, meaning makers of saints, they've turned him into a saint. He was much more interesting than that. He was a tough, hard politician. And he was certainly the most brilliant man ever to be the president of the United States. And he was probably the most important man the last 200 years. He said once, where would Lincoln have been without the Civil War? Just another railroad lawyer. Well, that's about it. I mean, he figured out wartime presidents just as this silly little thing we have now as president. People go in for such skullduggery blackmail that goes on. And I knew, of course, that, that is exactly what has always gone on. Jackie used to mourn. She said, you know, we spend all this money trying to find out things about the other side, and we never use it. <laughs> She looked tragic at the thought of all that money wasted. Now, you know, the funny thing, I watched that press conference, and he was so nervous, and, you know, every time that voice gets very sincere, you know he's pulling something. <laughs> I never thought I would see the day that an American president would say, I am not a crook. And I will say he didn't look the camera in the eye. Did you notice the eyes went, I would... But the thing that most touched me was every now and then he, he tried to get vigorous because he's heard about other presidents and he knows the way they act. And, and he said, and I speak as commander in chief. And the strange, tricky look comes over his face, you know, as though somebody's going to come with a hook and pull him back. I said, no, no, this is all a dream, Dick. You're back in uh, San Clemente, you know, practicing law, chasing ambulances or whatever Chuck. nature is designed him for. We had one of our numerous doomed presidents came here to campaign, Jimmy Carter, who could not set a foot right. And I was offered met Reagan as an actor to play the part of a presidential candidate. And I told his agent, I said, no way. Ronald Reagan would never be convincing as a presidential candidate. And poor Ronald Reagan had to become the acting governor of California and now the acting president of the United States. Ronald Reagan's library just burned down. Both books were destroyed. <laughs> but the real horror, he had not finished coloring the second. <laughs> and yet he goes marching around, I'm wartime president, I'm wartime president, I'm wartime president. Well, he isn't one. He's a great He's warrior. A... Well, he smashed up his airplane. Normally, you, you get, in the Navy, normally you get court-martial for that. Then... It is a novelty in Chicago, that is too bad. But I assume that the, the point of the American yeah. democracy and some is you can Nazi express too. any some point of view you want. Nazi. Shut up a minute. No, I won't. And some people were pro-Nazi, and the answer is that they were, they were well-treated by people who ostracized them. And I'm for ostracizing people who egg on other people to shoot American Marines and American soldiers. As, I know you don't as care. As far as I'm concerned, the only sort of pro- or crypto-Nazi yeah. I can think of is yourself. Uh, Failing that, let's, I would let's, only let's say that we names. can't have now listen, you the right yeah. of the Stop calling me a crypto-Nazi. Let's, let's stop calling I'll names. I'll you in your goddamn face, and you'll stay plastered. Gentlemen, let's go. Let the author of Myron Bracken, Breckenridge I, go back to his pornography and stop making any illusions of Nazi. I beg somebody you to. Was infantry in the last war. You were not an infantry, as a matter of fact. I was a second fighter. You were not. Now you're distorting your own military yeah. record. Was that a very... Where's Bill Buckley tonight? Bill? <laughs> Bill? <laughs> you can come out now. <laughs> The last time I sat on this stage, I think in this chair, I was afflicted by, I felt the, like the pharaoh of Egypt, uh, by a fly. <laughs> it was an awful fly. Every time I started to talk, it was and I, would, and I kept missing it and missing it. And then you remember that movie, The Fly, and which there's a little voice comes out and says, Help, help. I realized it was the late Truman Capote had come back. <laughs> About Capote, he was the most illegitimate literary figure we ever produced. He was also a consummate liar. He never stopped lying. And I finally took him to court. I sued him for libel, and I won. And he has to print a huge apology 
to me in one of his very last books. Uh -huh. Getting back to Capote again, did you say what I heard you had said when he died? Well, I said it, but I said it in <laughs> private to Jason Epstein, my editor, who had rung me from New York to say that Truman had ridden on ahead and crossed the Shining River. Mm -hmm. And I did say it. Well, that was a good career move. So you did say it. I yeah. did say it, but I did not say it to the public. And Jason, of course, told everybody. And so I got full credit for having been stony-hearted at the loss of a confrere <laughs> uh, without price. Yeah the greatest jewel, the greatest zircon in the diadem of American literature. Are you ready to apologize? Uh, I would apologize if, uh, if it hurts your feelings, of course I would. No, it hurts my sense of intellectual pollution. Well, I must say, as, I mean, uh, as an the, expert, you should know uh, about I would that. shop in Italy. You set up your home in Italy. But why Italy at all? Why did you not want to come back to America? I find, in many ways, I think like an Italian. No compliment to their glorious race, but... It, it saves a lot of time when you live in a country you know pretty much what other people's reactions are. For me, I'd, I could only get that if I went out to Kansas to live and uh, live with farming folk. Salt of the earth, salt of the earth. It was the only village I ever lived in was that section of Rome back of the Pantheon. For 20 years, I have rented a small penthouse on top of the moldering 17th century Origo Palace in the middle of what bureaucratic Romans call the historic center and everyone else calls Old Rome. By and large, the shops are exactly like the shops of 2,000 years ago as preserved at Pompeii and Ostia. A single deep room with a wide door that can be shuttered and a counter at the back. Produce is displayed on benches or tables on the sidewalk or in the doorway. Fresh food in season is all important here and we talk a lot about food. The herb shop we Americans don't pronounce the H, has been doing business for over a century. Dark wooden paneling and drawers, porcelain apothecary jars with gilt Latin inscriptions. An old woman suddenly turns to me in a state of ecstasy. I am 90 years old, she says, and everything in the streets changed except this place. It's the same, the same. That, I fear, is the retrograde joy of our village life. Even our lunatics are always the same. For decades now, the flower woman goes out each day in the bus to the cemetery to steal flowers from new graves. Then she returns to the street and sits in the doorway of a deconsecrated church and makes up bouquets. We are worried lately about her loss of the last set of dentures. Yes, we are all growing old. But a baby's being born to the wife of the hardware store owner. Well, a half dozen babies were a few years ago, and now men and women. So, plenty more where we came from. That is the lesson of the street. Why have you moved back to Hollywood? Trying to, to do the Hollywood Hills version of happiness. If you remember what Socrates said, Socrates, right, just the untelevised life is not worth living. <laughs> is your resolute pessimism to do with the feeling of you've given it your best shot and they haven't really listened to you, so sod them? No, my attitude has been sod them anyway. <laughs> with or without that, my best shot. Or perhaps that is my best shot, starting them. Do you find, are there any compensations in getting older or not? No, of course there are no compensations. Um, the work will soon be done. I suppose there's a sense of relief there, except one likes the work, to do the work. 
One fascinating thing about age is that, uh, at least in my case, you have no fear of death at all. When I was young, I was just, I was a thanatophobe, if that is a word. I mean, I really hated the idea of being dead. I might be missing something. Now I know that there's nothing to be missed.